let's see, I've given you uh, a copy, uh, both in soft copy and in hard copy, of this particular situation we want to use as an example, and we want to bring into one example the, both the process and all of the mechanisms, the you know, disregarded entity things, the foreign tax credit, subpart F, guilty. We want to try to bring all of these into one, let's say, concrete example, which will hopefully bring these things together. Again, the goal is for you to have some sort of a sense as to how things work in the real world uh, so that you can see how these things have an effect and how you can hopefully use them down the road for uh, your employer. Uh, we'll start out with this, uh, this set of facts. Company X, it's been around 75 years. It's a real company. It has 10,000 employees. It has uh, obviously great knowledge and uh, background in design and construction of uh, petrochemical facilities. Company Y in country B, which is unrelated. Uh, maybe it's a, uh, an oil company, a major oil company in country B. Uh, is looking for a new petrochemical facility, and uh, uh, the facility will be built by Company X in country, uh, in, on a particular site uh, in Country B. X and Y have signed one contract that just says, you know, it may go on for 150 pages, but it just says, for $200 million, X will construct this and will design it to achieve certain objectives in terms of what the feedstock is and what the, uh, the output will be in terms of different products and so on. Let's say, they, uh, let's say they sign this contract and they start work. If we attempt to uh, diagram that, we're going to have uh, X, we're going to have Y, are we reasonably there? Okay. We're going to have Y, this is the US, this is country B, the work site is right here. What functions are going to be done by X to actually achieve this so that it can transfer after some period of time, a completed petrochemical facility. Now, if you look at the handout, worksheet one, you see a bunch of expense items on there. And that's maybe a good way to say, uh, what are the some of the functions that are in this? Okay, what's, uh, what's the first item? Salaries. Okay, salaries for what? Okay, I see construction salaries and benefits locally hired. And we see also construction management and specialists hired overseas. So we see that there's going to be a bunch of people who are, uh, who are going to be working here. We have a lot of people who are going to be work on the job, uh, on the work site, who are going to be doing something. And let's say there's going to be you know, 400 of them. Let's say 350 are locally hired. Uh, 50 of them are uh, are foreign barbarians who are brought in uh, uh, for their specialized knowledge and, and expertise. Do you think finding these 50 people or these 350 people uh, requires some effort? Yeah, I mean, have any of you had uh, uh, interviews with uh, potential uh, companies that you would uh, would uh, would uh, perhaps work for? Yeah, there's a lot of effort that goes into pro procuring people, and some of that effort, that function, 
will be performed back at X in the US. Some of that will be performed at Y. This is part of what I'll call the fact finding part of this thing. You know, what's happening? Where are they doing it? Who's doing it? How are they doing it? All of these kinds of questions. So there's, there's some amount of effort that's going on at the work site in country B to find and interview and bring on local workers. And there's something going on at, uh, back in the United States at X to find uh, qualified foreign persons who are going to come in. So that's, uh, that's one thing. Uh, what's, uh, what's another on this list? Okay, construction materials. You know, if you look at uh, any construction site in Seattle, do you see a lot of stuff that gets delivered every day? Well, you, you haven't been looking, but if you were to look at a, at a uh, job site, you know, is there, you know, is there rebar being delivered and drywall and plumbing fixtures? Who orders that stuff and makes sure that it gets delivered all at the right time because there's limited storage space on the work site? Yeah, there's probably a department of people. Maybe uh, some of them actually come to the work site and perform their function there. Some of them are back at, uh, at X. Same thing with uh, equipment to be installed as opposed to the, the actual construction materials. Uh, another major thing, uh, engineering and design, salaries and benefits here. So there's, there's a number of people, because we're saying the cost element is $5 million in this. There's a number of people who have to design this thing and figure out all the engineering to make sure that the feedstock, when it comes in, actually produces the desired products in a quality that's acceptable under the terms of the contract and quantities. So there's, there's quite a bit uh, of that. And again, uh, probably most of those people are going to be back at X, but maybe there's some of them uh, at the work site, but uh, probably most of them are going to be back at X. Architectural costs. Can I have an outside architect firm that's, that's involved? I put down technology with a zero. Why is it zero? It's that you use the past tense. It's already developed. There's no actual out-of-pocket cost for the technology. It's already there. Did you know, you know, the expense of portion for the usage of technology or? Ah. When you say you don't get uh, to expense, who is you? Uh, well, it's, well, okay, so this is just a project. So the company would, but not the project. It's so far, we have only two companies uh, on, this, on the board. Later, we'll have more. But right now, we have only two companies, X and Y. We are, con we, X is our client, okay? Y is paying $200 million for this. We really don't care how Y is accounting for its purchase price of 200 That's another taxpayer, and we really don't care how they're doing it. But X is taxable in the United States. X is potentially taxable in country B. So X cares as to what its expenses are with respect to this project. And because it is using already developed research which it expensed in prior years, it doesn't have any cost basis for tax purposes in the US or generally anywhere else. It doesn't have any cost basis in the technology which it's using in this job. Now, it, of course, is continuing to do R&D, but that continuing R&D is for some other thing which isn't used in this project. 
because they're using you know, already developed technology, not new technology. So even though economically you'd say, gee, uh, you know, I paid for that R&D, it doesn't actually show up as an expense. So that's you know, part, of, uh, part of this. OK, so uh, we've identified some functions. You know, maybe uh, you know, maybe Ken has decided to become uh, you know a member of the Country B uh, Tax Authority, and as a result, he looks out his window and he sees this work site and he thinks, "Gee, you know, maybe there's a contractor doing this who should be paying tax." You know, are they? So he walks outside and he. Uh, he comes down to uh, the work site, and he uh, uh, he asks, uh, you know, who's in charge. And Josh says that uh, he's in charge. So, Ken, what does Ken ask Josh for? What's probably the first thing he asks Josh for? A copy of. Pardon. Uh, well, let's say he's uh, he, he might, but let's say he's from the income tax as opposed to the local uh, licensing uh, uh, licensing office uh, govern you know that uh, looks at real estate matters. If he's from the income tax office, what is he likely to ask for? A copy of the subs? Well, he might if he's from the individual tax side and he wants to make sure that. Josh, in fact, is paying his his personal salary. What about a copy of the contract between X and Y? Okay, that's probably the first thing he's going to ask for. And what's he going to see? He's going to see a big number on there, which is $200 million. He's going to see that the client that is paying for that is why. He's also going to see that the work site is right here. And gee, this, you know, this looks like the $200 million is, you know, income of a permanent establishment of X in Y. You know, I'm sorry, of X in country B. A permanent establishment of X in country B. And by gosh, you know, we have tax rules that allow us to tax the income attributable to that permanent establishment in the terms of what you talked about in uh, T515. It's how we calculate the effectively connected attributable to the trader business which X is conducting in country B. He looks at this and he says, okay, gee, I want to tax that, and this gets us to our uh, worksheet two, uh, and we come down, you know, uh, Ken does his calculations, he makes a couple of adjustments in terms of how much expenses are allowed, he says the taxable income is 50 million, 20% tax rate in country B, give me 10 million. Uh, as the tax on this. Does Ken look greedy? Or does this sort of make sense? You don't want to insult Ken by calling him greedy? Or do you think this makes sense? Personally, I think this makes reasonable sense. The contract gives one number, 200. Yeah, so there's some functions being performed back in the U.S., but does the contract give Ken any ability or any logic for dividing up that 200 between the portion which is attributable to actual activities within the permanent establishment in country B? It really doesn't. The various activities that happen outside are, in a sense, contributing, of course, to uh, what the... Uh, permanent establishment is selling. And we don't have a tax treaty between the U.S. and country B. 
assuming that is part of the facts. Uh, there's no tax treaty that gives a mechanism for trying to allow the two governments to agree on something. So it's pretty reasonable that Ken says, give me 10 million. That full 200 is the starting point for calculating tax in country B. Now, I won't go through the, uh, the details of the other worksheets, but uh, let's think back to our foreign tax credit rules. X is a U.S. company. X has paid 10 million of tax to country B. Is X, first of all, able to claim a foreign tax credit with respect to that 10 million? And I see some nods of heads, and that's right. This is a directly paid tax because X is the taxpayer. We're not talking about a deemed paid tax, which was one of the subjects we talked about. X is the taxpayer. X has paid 10 million. Now, what about the foreign tax credit limitation? You may recall the formula. Uh, anybody have the formula indelibly etched in their minds? Everybody looks down and uh, a few people <laughs> smile. Okay. Limitation equals the U.S. tax before the credit times foreign source taxable income over worldwide taxable income. And is that foreign source taxable income, is it calculated based on country B rules or on U.S. rules? You're absolutely right. It is calculated on U.S. rules. Why? Because the U.S. wants to protect its tax base. Remember, the whole concept of the foreign tax credit limitation is don't allow any offset of U.S. tax on U.S. source income by the foreign tax credit. The U.S. gets to tax that fully, the U.S. source portion, at 21%, no offset for foreign taxes. So as a result, when X does its foreign tax credit limitation comp comp uh, calculation, it will use U.S. rules. Now let's assume that in this case, the U.S. treats this as services income as opposed to selling an item of real property, uh, which you know, might also be uh, a possible characterization. Let's say the U.S. says it's a, it's a service. What's the sourcing rule that you remember from T515 for services? Yeah, absolutely, location performed. So some of the services, obviously the design and engineering component, most of that is in the United States. The procurement, some of that is in the United States, some other things. Okay, so when we do this based on U.S. concepts, because it's services, that 200 million has to be broken up by value so that we can say how much of that 200 is attributable to U.S. activities, how much is attributable to non-U.S. activities. And surprisingly enough, if you, you know, go through to, I think, uh, number four, uh, which has the U.S. source, foreign source income calculation, uh, of the 200, we're saying that 137 is considered to be the foreign source portion. Not 200, but 137. And when we come down to the bottom, instead of you know, a much higher, uh, much higher uh, net income figure uh, for the uh, instead of that 
you know, that 50 million, which was the basis under, under country B's rules, uh, we come up with 17 million under the uh, U.S. rules uh, to, uh, to determine foreign source taxable income. So there's this big difference between the basis on which country B applied tax and the calculation of foreign source taxable income, which is obviously very, very important for the limitation on the foreign tax credit. At the end of the day, uh, we end up with using these numbers, which are not unreasonable numbers. We end up with country B tax of the 10 million and additional U.S. tax of about 5.5 million, which gives us an effective tax rate on the total of about 32.5%. Now, gee, we had a 20% rate in country B. We had a 21% rate in the United States, and yet our effective tax rate is much higher. So this is obviously something we want to avoid. This is the kind of thing that can happen if you do no tax planning. So this then leads to the next question of, gee, what, what might we do? We've talked about these, these various functions. We've talked about these, um, uh, these various things that are happening inside, outside. Let's say that, uh, let's say that X, now I'm, I'm shortcutting this sum, of course, because of time, but uh, the, um, we can talk about it uh, more uh, later on, either you know, individually or in the class, uh, uh, if that would be helpful. Let's say that X creates a CFC uh, let's say this is in uh, country A uh, creates a CFC and then puts a subsidiary in country B that will be in fact let me let me uh, stop for a moment and uh, uh, go back just a moment part of tax planning and especially in the case of for example something like this where where X has clearly gone through a bidding process against other possible suppliers of this petrochemical facility to Y. X wants to be in the best position to get, uh, to be able to offer the lowest price that it can and still make a reasonable amount of money. The hope is that it has a better chance of, uh, of securing the contract, winning the bid uh, uh, for the contract with Y. So let's say that, uh, that X has called you in ahead of time and said, please help me so that I can give the best possible bid. I don't want to be in this position where my tax rate is 33% or whatever that was. So you come to X and you say, well, uh, gee, you have a CFC and let's, let's assume for the sake of argument because X has been around for 75 years that X in fact does have some regional locations where it really does have activities and operations to support projects in various parts around the world. So let's say there's in fact, a little bit of substance behind this, that there is a place for the CFC. And we will assume that A happens also to be a very low tax or zero tax location. Now, one of the important things in terms of helping a client in a situation like this is to help them put their bid together. Should it be one simple contract between X and Y? Or can we achieve something better by having multiple 
contracts between X and X-owned companies, and why? We might, for example, suggest that Y would contract to the color, Y would contract with this local subsidiary for the local construction work, and maybe for locally acquired uh, raw materials and construction materials and uh, locally acquired uh, equipment. On the other hand, uh, for the foreign stuff, maybe there would be another uh, another subsidiary which is going to contract with Y for the sale of tangible property. Maybe because there's, you know, I, I talked before about there being uh, a lot of technology here, but it's not being recognized because there's no basis in it. Well, all of you are working on the project, which normally includes the transfer of the rights to exploit some sort of business and technology out of the United States and into a foreign company. Could we do that here? Or maybe they've already done it at some point in the past. So let's assume that, yes, we could enter into, uh, or maybe it's already there, but we could enter into an agreement between X and the CFC to transfer certain rights to this uh, intellectual property, which you know allows this kind of construction activity to the CFC and to have some formula for compensation of the uh, of X. Now, that'll be taxable income to X, yes. But we could do that. And we could perhaps even have a cost-sharing agreement between them for improvements for the future. Now, Y, of course, is going to benefit from uh, this, the, the rights uh, in terms of the use of this, uh, this process and so on. It, as part of that, you know, 200 billion, if you're breaking it up among several contracts, you could have a license agreement between Y and the CFC to effectively cover some amount that is reasonable in amount for uh, for that technology, which is included within that overall 200 million. Uh, there uh, would also be, of course, the engineering and design part of this thing. Uh, uh, we could put that somewhere in here as well, uh, perhaps to here, and then, uh, of course, this one turns around and pays X some amount. There could be some, in a sense, markup there. Now, what have we achieved by doing this? Before, country B taxed X on the full 200 million at its normal 20% rate. 200 minus expenses, which was got to a net income of 50 million at uh, 20 percent. If we break this up in different pieces, we have changed the character of the income. We have in some cases changed how each type of income is taxed. No longer 20 percent on net, but maybe some of it for example, the part that represents uh, the income from the sale of tangible uh, assets, the, the overseas construction materials and equipment and so on, uh, that 
normally will not be taxed by country B at all. Similarly, payment for the engineering and design services. Now, this depends on the country. Some countries do apply a withholding tax to technical services, but a lot of them do not. If the services are truly performed outside of country B, very often the payments for such services will be free of any withholding tax. Uh, the license amount. Now, the license amount, remember, because there, was no, there were no expenses, the license amount is, uh, in essence, already a, a tax on the gross amount. We said that the license was worth what, 20 million in our numbers, I think. If there's, let's say, a 5% or 10% withholding tax on royalties, and Y withholds, you know, 5% or 10%, well, we've reduced the tax on that 20 million from 20% of it down to 5 or 10%, whatever the withholding rate is. Now, at the end of the day, uh, let's say we, you know, after all this planning, we come out and instead of a tax of 10 million, we come out with a tax of, let's say, 3 million in, in country B. Is Ken over here going to be bothered by the fact that the 10 million went down to 3 million? Is he going to, like Khrushchev did many years ago, take his shoes off and or his shoe off and pound on the table? Are you going to be mad about this, or are you just a mild mannered guy? You won't lose any sleep. Okay, but is it? Will you not lose any sleep because you really don't care, or is it because you don't know? <laughs> well, actually, it's more because you don't know. If you are doing your planning right, he only sees what you have set up. He does not see what would have happened if you did not do any planning. I periodically talk about there being a piece of plain white paper that you start with. You can put your boxes anywhere you want. You can, within this you know, group of companies which are all owned by X, you can create whatever intercompany agreements you want. You can create whatever pricing you can reasonably justify. And, you know, Ken looks at it, and for him, that's the first thing he sees. Now, he may quibble a little bit about the transfer pricing between, you know, these two companies, but he's very unlikely to look at the whole thing and say, hey, this is all nonsense. I'm going to ignore it all. That is very, very, very low risk. Courts, tax authorities, take the separate legal entities we create seriously. We just talked about country B. Now let's go back to country, uh, I'm sorry, go back to the US. Let's assume that we have made uh, the various subsidiaries of the CFC disregarded entities. As disregarded entities, all the U.S. government sees is, to use the term of art that, uh, that Darcy has coined, a blob, uh, the U.S. tax authorities only see one CFC that has divisions and operations in various places. They don't see and don't treat as intercompany transactions for transfer pricing purposes. They don't see uh, those because it's all within that one blob. There's one form 5471 that's filed uh, by X when it files its form 11, 1120. Once we do that, what, what are we looking at from a uh, from a subpart F standpoint, do we have any foreign-based company services income? Do we have any foreign-based company sales income? Let's take the sales first. What are the two items that are in 954D1? Foreign, 
you know, a related person somehow involved in the point of origination, point of destination outside the country of incorporation. The CFC, that blob, is buying equipment and construction materials from unrelated suppliers. It's selling it to Y, which is not related. There's no foreign-based company sales income. What about foreign-based company services income? On the surface, there's probably no foreign-based company services income because the CFC is acting on its own. It's performing services for why, yes, uh, there will be some services performed in the U.S. which uh, the CFC will pay an arm's length amount for. Again, another transfer pricing issue. But on the surface, the CFC is acting on its own. Now, you do have to be careful here. There is, There are some rules in the regulations under the foreign-based company services income category that if Y looks at this, you know, this bid and says, gee, you know, I'm happy to go along with all this nonsense, but, you know, I want to make sure that X is giving me a performance guarantee because, you know, these other companies don't have the assets and what have you. Where there's a performance guarantee, there can be some issues which you'd have to look at to see whether the CFC might be treated as having foreign-based company services income. So that is a, uh, a potential issue. But let's say, let's assume at least for, for our discussion that we sidestep this. Now, we've talked about disregarded entities. We've talked about transfer pricing. We've talked about subpart F. Uh, what about guilty? Uh, what about it, Darcy? I kind of want to know where it fits in the blob here. So if if we're, you know, I know the first thing we had to do is see if we have some part F. And we're assuming that we don't. Uh, yeah. I guess um, I guess what my question is: Where does guilty fit in in terms of like? And it's probably super obvious, but it's not obvious to me. And this transfer pricing. It seems well, like the, the second thing we always look at. Right. The, the, what you're bringing up is order of application. Order of application. For the most part, 482 is done first. Then you apply subpart F. Then you apply guilty. Right. Because the concept is the amount of income from each transaction within each legal entity, which is part of the group, has to be right before you apply uh, the subpart F for guilty rules. So transfer pricing normally comes first. It seems like what we've just said is once we have our CFC here, everything that happens that the CFC owns is just a bunch of scribbling. I mean, nothing against your artwork, but no, it's like, it's like, it's like we don't care. And at the U.S. level, we don't care, right? We've said, here's your CFC. Here's yeah, your you're right. The only, the only, uh, in a sense, uh, transfer pricing things we worry about are ones that are between X and the CFC, yeah. which includes the transfer of technology, the cost sharing agreement payment for services. So those are real transfer pricing things. But um, within the blob, uh, there is no worry about it. Now, what did we say was the basis for application of guilty? It's essentially the total income of the company, uh, of the CFC, that is, of the blob. It's the total income. Now, there's a few subtractions, and there's also the 10% of tangible asset subtraction. But starting point is the total income and minus the 10% of tangible assets. So that which is likely to be the bulk of the income that the CFC earns is going to be guilty 
and includable in X's income, but because X is a corporation, it gets the 50% deduction that is allowed against guilty that will result in the 10.5% tax rate. So we know, okay, so we know that, right? So we know that. And, the, and I guess just an understanding of why we don't, we also we know we don't get carried forward and carried back with guilty, right? And we give it, but there, I have these notes that say there's an automatic 20% haircut. And I don't know what the right. haircut's about. Oh, the haircut is that it reduces the amount of available foreign tax credit. If, if, uh, if we paid to Y, uh, let's say, uh, to make it a nice round number, five million to country Y, then we would get a haircut of 20%, which is one million. We could only claim a maximum of four million of foreign tax credit. And that's just a black black line. We don't care about it. It's another one of those sledgehammers that I talk about. So the point, uh, a point to be made is that although guilty applies to this, X is still better off under normal circumstances to have this kind of structure because assuming it reduces the foreign taxes sufficiently in, uh, in country uh, B, uh, it will end up with that 10.5% rate instead of a 21% rate in the U.S. I think it was uh, Jen who brought up FDII. Uh, yeah, FDII might potentially apply to some of this if X were to, you know, back in the, uh, the situation where X is doing it all itself and has done no tax planning. But the 50% the deduction that's under Code Section 250, right, for the guilty, which is the same section of FBII is calculated under. Yeah, the, both of them are under 250. Oh, that's just the right there. Yeah, they're just different subsections uh, within it.